Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Red Light Sports Ramble. I am Troy Otradovic, as always, joined with Evan Watalison. Evan, today is kind of a historic day for us. This is the 150th episode of the Red Light Sports Ramble, and it falls on Wednesday, which means that tonight is Twitter talk. So, it is going to be a great episode. How are you feeling today? I know we were talking before and you said you were a little upset at some kids, so I hope you're not going to pull that frustration over into the ramble tonight. But how are you feeling today, bud? Uh, other than just being frustrated on my students, I'm uh, feeling good. I uh, get to get to ramble, get to talk sports, and you know, get to have a little bit of fun here. And then I'm going to the, uh, the Milwaukee Bucks game later tonight. They're playing the uh, Phoenix Suns, and we'll see if, uh, you know, how the... Uh, how the Bucks do tonight probably, you know, be a loss since they're quite horrible right now. But we'll see. Oh, they're beyond horrible. But I'll tell you what, Bud. I was born and raised in Green Bay, and I'm a Wisconsin fan through and through. I bleed Wisconsin sports. I love my Bucks. Go Bucks! I still cheer for them. I hold out hope that they're going to get some W's. But you know what? The season is about halfway over, and it'll be done before we know it. And then we can move on. So, yeah. you know, I still cheer for them. I hold out hope. Just, yeah, you're right. They're horrible this year. But it is what it is. You, you know, I still cheer for them. I'm not a bandwagon guy. I cheer for them, but I can truly say they suck this year. They're terrible. Yeah. But moving on. And well, the fortunate thing is right now they're guaranteed a top four pick. Oh, yeah. Uh, right now. Like if the season were to end right now, um, they would, they're guaranteed at least a top four lottery pick. And, you know, they didn't go into the year with the intention to tank, but now at this point, just uh, go for that, you know, go for one of those top four picks and get one of the, the superstars that are going to be at the top of the draft. I'll tell you, I'll tell you this though, but I, I, I think they can go and try to play to try to win and they're still going to lose. Uh, that's how bad they are. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> that's how bad they are. I don't think they have to try and tank it. I just don't think they can win. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, I watch, I watch them play, and it's just like, man, this is not a good product. But, like I said, I still cheer for them. You know, I still hold out hope. I love my bucks. So, with that said, I also want to fill the listeners in. We may have some new listeners that are coming in. I know I shared it with you yesterday quickly in an email, but uh, you and I, the Red, the Red Light Sports Ramble, had been in contact with the Washington Wild Things, which is a a minor league baseball team in a frontier league, independent team. And we had applied for media credentials. And they opened their arms up to us, Evan, for the Red Light Sports Ramble. So this upcoming baseball season, this upcoming baseball season, we're going to be able to cover the the Washington Wild things, which is about 45 minutes from my house. Um, We're going to be able to get up in the press box, maybe do some rambles from the stadium, um, be able to, to get some interviews with the players and the coaches, really follow that team and talk about minor league baseball. It's going to be great baseball season to mix it in with the Brewers and the Pirates and everything that's going on. Plus, in Washington is also now the Washington Rebellion, which is a women's fast pitch team professional. And they also opened up their arms to the Red Light Sports Ramble. Uh, We're following each other on Facebook now. I know you and I are excited to work with that organization to be able to promote women's fast pitch softball. So it was a good day yesterday for the Red Light Sports Ramble to set up that relationship with these two teams. I know you're excited. I'm excited. Just want to share that with our listeners, and we might have some listeners that are now fans of both those teams. So as we go through the show, feel free to give us a call, and we'll talk about the wild things in the rebellion as those seasons get started. But I know you and I are excited about that. I wanted to fill the fans in. With a little bit of that news to stay tuned when baseball season starts because it'll be a fun thing. But let's move on, Evan. We've got three really good topics tonight. We had some great input. Twitter talk is really taking off and we're getting a lot of feedback. And I know there was a question yesterday from one of our very loyal listeners, Gene Edwardson. And he wanted to know about the draft needs of the Packers. And so... 
it is more for a ramble closer to the draft. But let's talk a little bit today and let's address that question, Evan. What are some of the positions that you feel that the Green Bay Packers need to address as the draft comes up? Well, a lot of that's going to depend on who comes back and who leaves via free agency, which the Packers and uh, Sam Shields' agents have started contract negotiations, which is good. Um, maybe, they, maybe they'll get uh, a, a, a long-term contact on with Shields. But looking at the team, they, you know, they need help on the defensive line desperately. You know, especially with Raji, Wilson, Jolly, and Pickett, all free agents. They could really use some help on the D-line. They could use some help at middle linebacker, um, use some help at outside linebacker, use some help at safety. I think, those, you know, basically those uh, those parts of the defense is where they need the most help, safety being priority number one right now, which, you know, they could, if they choose to, um, address via free agency, um, but we all know how they feel about free agency. But they could also use a tight end. Um, both uh, Finley and Corliss are free agents at the end of the year, or not the end of the year, but they're free agents starting in March, the beginning of the league the league year, and they definitely could possibly use a new tight end. So those are probably the biggest positions of need right now. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of that's going to depend – as we get closer to free agency and we see who leaves, who doesn't leave. And, you know, we're going to do, you know, we're going to definitely, as the draft comes close, we dedicate a episode to the draft, maybe, uh, maybe two episodes directly to the draft and what the Packers need and talk about some key players that they should look at. Well, let's talk a little bit about free agency. And this is a question that came up from yesterday's announcement. Ted Thompson's already being active, bud. Hopefully this isn't his biggest signing. But we signed a fullback yesterday, and he's got a crazy name. And I'm looking at Packers.com, and the pronunciation, I hope I say it right. And I apologize if I don't, but they signed fullback Ina Lea Ina. A six foot, 250-pound player out of San Jose State. Spent part of the offseason in 2013 with the Miami Dolphins. He appeared in 43 games with the Spartans. 54 carries, 150 yards, a touchdown, 14 receptions, 134 yards. I don't really care about the stats. I care about the blocking. But my bigger concern is, does this mark the end of John Kuhn in Green Bay? What do you think, Evan? Is this a sign that John Kuhn is on his way out? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I actually just saw on Twitter, just as we were starting, and I'd have to go down on my timeline to find it, but the Packers uh, agent, I mean, John Kuhn's agent, is pretty optimistic about uh, John Kuhn coming back to Green Bay. So um, I don't think it marks the end of his career, and I would have to see the contract details of the guy they just signed, but I'm guessing if he, if he doesn't work out, um because the Packers need to get, you know, they can get the roster up to, I believe, 93 now or 90. You know, they can grow the roster to that size and then they got to shrink down. So I don't, if this guy doesn't, you know, make the roster, I tend to doubt it's going to cost Green Bay too much to cut him. I'm guessing it's not going to be a cap hit. So it doesn't mean the end of Kuhn, but I guess it is kind of a security blanket if Kuhn does decide to sign as elsewhere. But I think Kuhn's biggest value is in Green Bay, I don't think he gets the same value in any other market. So I think Kuhn is still going to be back. Yeah, I think he's going to be back too, but I had to bring it up because I saw the question on Twitter, you know, and I saw it on Facebook. The thing with fullbacks is the fullbacks are a dying breed in the NFL right now, and you got to find the right system that uses a fullback. The Green Bay Packers are, are one of a handful of teams that still utilize the fullback position. There's a lot of teams that don't even carry a fullback. The Steelers didn't carry a fullback for a couple years. It was a big topic of discussion here in Pittsburgh. You know, they didn't have a true fullback on their roster. So I think the full- Maybe they have the H-back is what they call it, you know, that tight end uh, cleaner guy that's kind of undersized to be a tight end. They usually put them at fullback typically late now in the NFL. Somebody that can play tight end if they need him to, you know, he can catch the ball really well. Uh, but he's not the big thumper blocker like the fullback used to be. Yeah, well, like I said, Green Bay is a good fit for him. Green Bay still utilizes the fullback, not 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 exclusively, 
but we still utilize it in our package. So I'm with you. I don't think that it's the end of John Kuhn's career in Green Bay. Um, this isn't a huge, and I did the old finger curl as, as I use the word here. I know people can't see me, but this is not a huge signing. It's just another player, in, in my opinion. I mean, this guy has never played in the NFL, never played a game. Can he block? That's what the fullback does in Green Bay. Can the fullback yeah. block? So we'll find out. But Can he pick up the blips? Exactly. It, it, that is a, a very good point, Evan. So, like you said, he's on the roster. If we have to cut him, he hasn't played in the NFL. Probably nothing as far as a cap hit, I would imagine. So, staying in the NFL, staying with our loyal listeners, we have a very loyal listener, which is Gene Edwardson's son, Derek. And he is a, a loyal, loyal listener. Um, always, you know, Basically communicates through his father, Gene. But I know Derek listens to the show. So Derek wanted to know today, Evan, and I'll let you go first, is the cold weather Super Bowl. Is this something that we're going to continue to see, and should it continue to be played in a cold weather climate? What's your opinion on that, bud? Well, and it's kind of funny. We asked, you know, this question comes up, and yesterday, the, you know, six states down south were – shut down due to uh, due to snow and ice, and two of those states are states that typically do host the Super Bowl, Atlanta, Georgia, so the state of Georgia and Louisiana, you know, they, they had some snow issues. So it's kind of funny this question gets asked, are we ever going to see a snow, a uh, cold weather site host the Super Bowl again when you had those, you know, that part of the country that everyone wants the Super Bowl to go to dealing with um, weather that we typically see up in this part of the country. Now, I guess if it, if it is played out, you know, up in this part of the country again, I think it's only going to be in the dome. So like Minnesota, Detroit, I can see getting a Super Bowl. And I honestly could see them trying to put one in Seattle. You know, I know it's up north, uh, and the weather could be an issue, but I just think I could see them putting a Super Bowl in that stadium. But no, I don't see a cold weather uh, city, you know, hosting the Super Bowl that has an open air stadium. And I don't really see too many stadiums open air in this part of the country that can host a Super Bowl. You know, the city of New York or New Jersey, where the stadium is, they can handle it. But you look at like Chicago, they possibly could. But you're right on that lake. That's going to be very brutal to have a game there. And Lambeau doesn't have the the hotel space that's needed for a Super Bowl. And, you know, those would be the cities that would be looked at. And I don't know about Pittsburgh too much. You'd have to throw that out there. But, like, you know, like Green Bay and Chicago, like I said, they wouldn't be able to host it. Don't have the uh, the, the uh, hotel room and then, like I said, be right on the lake in Chicago. But I, I don't think it'll happen again. And if it does, it'll be like in Seattle um, or in a domed stadium up in this part of the country. Yeah, and I'll touch. Uh, actually, I, I believe Pittsburgh would have the capacity. A few years back, they hosted, a, a, I don't know if it was a World Summit. Um, but they have the infrastructure in Pittsburgh that they could make that happen. But I'm with you. I, I think all the bells and whistles and you know the, the change to say we're going to play it in New York – Honestly, I don't like the idea, and I, I'm not saying it because I'm a, a wimp or a chicken. I'm saying it more from the business aspect. I mean, right now, Super Bowl tickets are so, I will say, overly priced that a number of the fans in They're those dropping right now. Well, of course, well because of the Super Bowl, right? Being cold. Why is that? Yeah. The thing is, the thing that are, that scares me is that you do have. Denver fans, which are used to the cold, and you have Seattle fans, and, and there are fans, there are true fans that will go to the game. But half that stadium is full of businessmen, companies that buy the, buy the tickets, people that maybe have never went to a regular season game in their life. Just going, I'm going to go to the Super Bowl because I can afford to go to the Super Bowl. The average working Joe. It's hard for them to afford the trip to a Super Bowl, let alone afford the ticket, and be able to to enjoy the festivities. 
It's becoming, in my mind, overpriced venue. It's a great game, don't get me wrong. But in my mind, it's becoming an overpriced venue for the average football fan to go enjoy the game. And those are the true fans. It's people like you and me that work hard for a living, our listeners that work hard for a living. You know, to, for us to be able to afford that, that's, that's a lot of money. And I'm afraid that when we look on Sunday, if the weather conditions are bad, you're not going to have a full stadium. Now, the tickets are already yeah. sold and the revenue is there. But if the stadium's not full, to me, that's not the purpose of this game. I, I love old school football. You know, I'm from Green Bay. You're in Wisconsin. We're Green Bay people. We like the cold weather games. But I'll tell you what, as a fan, it, it is uncomfortable at times. I, I told you, yeah. I, was, I was at that playoff game when the Packers held Barry Sanders to negative yards rushing. That was the coldest game that I've ever been at. My father was at the I ice. I was at the 49er game <laughs> this year. My father was at the ice bowl and just said it. it's purely uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable in that playoff game. Even though it was a great game, and I'll tell you what, half the game I was worried about staying warm. Everything was cold, and I was bundled up. And it's just uncomfortable. And so a game of that magnitude, I'm saying it is now a venue that is a – a, a huge spectacular event. It's an event, right? You've got all of the festivities this week. It, it is a it is a big event, almost like the football holiday. So it should be enjoyable to the fans, and that's my argument. It's not so much about the players playing in the cold weather. I'm okay with that, but I really believe the Super Bowl is a spectacle for the fans to enjoy that. And so you should try to make that as comfortable as you can. I mean, the Super Bowl, when the Packers played, there was an ice storm in Dallas. I I mean, you're you're going to get the weather. But my point is, the stadium should be packed. The fans should be rambunctious. The fans should want to basically party all night long. And when it's going to be single-digit weather, it's hard to do those things. Because you are just frozen solid. So... That's where I go. You know, we'll see how this goes. But in my mind, I don't think they should ever have a game in the cold weather climate again. I think it should be in a dome. I think it should, and to be honest, even the Super Bowl, I'm thinking, should just be in a dome. Because even when you go to a venue outside, it could rain. It it could be that weather. And, you know, I'm okay with that. But for a, a game of this magnitude, I think it should be enjoyable for all parties involved. Players, fans, coaches, media, all those things. I feel bad for all those media people. And I'll tell you what, I my props go out to all the meteorologists that I see bundled up in hats and gloves and winter coats that are standing outside in New York reporting on the weather. I give them props. They have a lot of courage to do that, to take that assignment. But with that said, bud, I'm with you. I think this is the only time we're going to see it in our future. I think it should, it, you know, if it's going to be played up north, it'll probably be in a dome. So leaves us about 11 minutes out. And I know your brother, Sean Watallison, had tweeted out a topic yesterday. So thank you, Sean. Definitely something that uh, Evan and I were talking about. This topic, Evan, could open up a can of worms. That would be way more than 10 minutes we have left in the show and way more than just a 30-minute episode, but it could turn into a Saturday rant. But it's about this whole idea of a college football union. So I've babbled enough. I'm going to let you take over and talk about your opinion of having a college football union. You know, of all places to... uh decide to try to, you know, form a college, you know, college athletic union as Northwestern, you know, they're well known for their, their law school that they have there. So it's kind of fitting that they're the city that decide that we want a, a, a college athlete union. But looking at it, I get what they're trying to do. You know, a lot of, of players nowadays, when they look at the revenue the NCAA is producing, it's almost like they're, be, you know, starting to become slave-like, and they put in so much work 
you earn the universities and the NCAA and their conferences so much money, and they get not a dime of it. So I get what they're trying to do. It's like, okay, you're making all this money off of us, and I'm just looking, focusing on the football and even basketball. You know, you're making all this money on us, and we get none of it. And, you know, I see what you're doing, but I don't think it's a good idea. You know, I would have to do a, a little more research into the, exactly what they're trying to do. But I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's a, it's a bad move. And as you said, it's going to open a huge can of worms. And it's going to open up even bigger issues. And I just, I don't like it. I think that there's other ways to do what they're doing. And you look at what uh, Ed O'Bannon's doing, you know, suing the NCAA and EA Sports. You know, that's, you know, in my opinion, a better way to do it. Because in those EA Sports video games, they are directly making revenue off of um, their their likeness. And I think the athletes should be able to, you know, get money off of their likeness, off of their signature, off of their brand. But, you know, I just think it's a bad idea. Well, you brought up a good point. And you and I touched on this on an earlier episode when the Johnny Manziel thing came up. And you and I are both in agreement that – my signature, I should be able to get reimbursed for that. You know, whether it's a, worth a dollar or worth a million dollars, that is mine. So why is the NCAA getting that money? And so the EA Sports thing, I'm with you. That's my likeness. That is me. Not that I'd ever be good enough to be on a video game. But if I was, I'd want to get reimbursed for that. But where does that money go? To the NCAA. Now, I'm with you. I look at this, and the NCAA, and I have said this, the NCAA is making millions upon millions of dollars from football revenue, March Madness, even other small non-revenue sports. The Frozen Four is getting very big with the hockey community. There's money being made on the Frozen Four. There's money being made in women's college basketball. There is a lot of money going to the NCAA and some back to the university, but it doesn't go down to the player. But I also don't think that these players should be making millions of dollars when they're in school. They are going to school, and sometimes you have to look at it from this standpoint. You are getting a benefit. You're getting your tuition paid, you're getting your room, you're getting your board, and so you are getting a benefit outside of a regular student. But again, that's where the can of worms is going to open up. But to get back to the main point of the question that your brother had brought up, I think the idea is just outlandish. Because as I told you while we were talking before the show, once a union gets put in place, whether it's football, basketball, hockey, baseball, whatever it is, all we're going to start seeing then is one injustice for a player and it's going to court. And it's going to court. And then another case goes to the court. Because then the ruling on that case, then every other athlete that that's happened to is going to court. Then there's arbitrators getting involved. And it's going to be nothing but a mess. If anybody that listens is in a union right now in regular employment jobs, you pay dues to the union. So whether it's the NCAA making the money, it could very well then be the union making the money. The, the unions that I know make a ton of money. How many people do we see, Evan, that work in steel mills, that work in those type industries that are striking because the, the employer is not giving the union what they want, so they say they walk out? I think a union could turn this into a huge fiasco. Now, do I think something needs to be done? Yes. I agree. Something needs to be done and something needs to get put in place, but it's not through the way of a union. Because now you're going to bring in a third party that will just cause more havoc amongst everything that's going on. So that's my take on that. And like I said, that very well could be a good Saturday rant for us about the college football union. And as more details would come out about how they'd want to do it, maybe there's some things in there that might make sense. I don't know. 
but I don't like the idea. I, I am totally against it. But, you know, that brings us part of that, and this is where the can of worms comes in, is you had mentioned college athletes being able to be paid for the resemblance. So we got just under five minutes. I mean, you had mentioned something to me about financial aid, and I thought it was a very good point. Let the listeners know what you had said about that type of payment that maybe some people don't know about, because I thought it was a great point that you brought up when we were talking before the show. Well, you know, I think, you know, we were talking before the show, and, you know, I, you, know you look at these athletes, the, you know, and it, I just go back to the whole Johnny Manziel thing um, over the summer when he was signing autographs, and, you know, people are selling those autographs for a lot of money. And he's not getting a single penny of it, so he allegedly started um, selling his autographs for a pretty penny. Now, when the athletes are not in season, they should be able to make money off their autographs. They should be able to make money off of their brand, which is their signature. And I have no issue with allowing them to profit off of that. Um, I guess, like I said, as long as it's like you know out of season. I don't see anything wrong with that. And I think a stipend would be well good as well, giving them some kind of stipend. But another way athletes can do it and get some extra money in their pocket is they can apply for financial aid, you know, because a lot of them are low, come from low-income families, a lot of the athletes. And you apply for financial aid, you get a bunch of different grants and you get a bunch of, you know, different loans that you can take out. And the grants are money that you just, you know, you're going to get, get, get to put right in your pocket because most of your education expenses are paid for and it's money you don't have to pay back. And that's one thing athletes can do. And I don't think a lot of them take advantage of it to have a little bit of extra spending money because they'll get, you know, up to, I believe up to $1,200, um, a semester with the Pell Grant. Yeah. I'm not sure on the actual amount, but you know, the idea that you're talking about in, you know, it's something to look into. I mean, how can, you know, and that's something the NCAA should look into. How can we help the students? Because you know what? They do deserve to have that spending money. And, you know, to be able to go out and to be able to, to have fun in college. You and I both went to college. We had fun. College was fun. Yeah. You know, but you need money to have fun, especially now. Cost, cost of living has went up from, you know, when I went to college. 20 bucks is not 20 bucks anymore. It'll probably be 40 now. You know, so there's money that needs to be involved. And if they don't have any money, that's why they're going to go down that road. And this is, again, now the can of worms opens up more because now you're going down the illegal route. They're, they're selling memorabilia. They're, they're doing things that, that are not legal to get this money and taking money from boosters because they need the cash. You know, so, again, this, yeah. this, this football union or athletic union, you know, it brings up this whole big can again. And like I said, you and I don't have enough time. We could sit here and ramble about this topic all night. 90 seconds. But there's the good old crazy lady, Evan. 90 seconds to go. So I'm going to tell you that, you know, enjoy the game tonight in Milwaukee. Go Bucks, go. Thank you. You know, with that said, I'll let you wrap the show up. I want to thank your brother, Sean. I want to thank Gene Edwardson. And I want to thank Derek for all of their input on Twitter talk. Always appreciate it on Wednesday night. I'll let you end the show, bud. We got just over a minute to go. Well, 60 seconds. Tomorrow, we were supposed to have a guest on, but unfortunately, he's not able to make it tomorrow. But tune in tomorrow as we're going to recap the specialist for Green Bay, the special teams guys, so the punter, kicker, returner, um, talk about them. And then Friday it would be the big episode going to preview the Super Bowl. So make sure to give us a listen, and thank you for those that are listening. Thank you for those uh, um, for those submitting topics, and it's always fun interacting with all, you, all of you. So um, for those that are suffering in the cold, Stay warm and be safe out there because it's getting pretty icy. It is getting That's icy. Fun. It is getting very icy. I also didn't. I also didn't even tell you yet. But Friday we're going to have Cass's uncle Al on the show, Evan, to give his prediction and uh, and some of his input about the Super Bowl. So it's going to be a great episode tomorrow and also Friday. With that said, everybody, 
Enjoy the night. Stay warm. We'll see you at the next red light.